Hello and welcome to the Practical Animal Channel. Today from the beaches of Spurn Point in East Yorkshire, England. Now, Joanna Perry Jones is a lady best known for giving flight demonstrations of birds of prey. In addition, she is the CEO, Chief Executive Officer of the International Centre for Birds of Prey in Newant, Gloucestershire, England. She's also a published author on birds of prey and she is an MBE. The International Centre for Birds of Prey was closing to the public. I spoke to Jemima asking her what being a published author had done for her career. What being a published author had done for her career as well as being an MBE. I asked her about her experience a few years ago closing the International Centre for Birds of Prey and moving to America and then coming back to England again and what the future held for her with the forthcoming closure of the ICBP. If you're new here, the channel is for you if you want to know what it takes to work with animals. Perhaps you want to work with farm animals or you want to work with wildlife. If with wildlife, maybe you want to work in a collection at a zoo or biodiversity venue, for instance, as a zookeeper. Or perhaps you want to work with wildlife in the wild, such as by working as a field biologist. Or to be blunt, perhaps you don't want to work with living animals at all, but dead ones, perhaps by being a taxidermist or a meat inspector. Whatever you want to be, we aim to cover it all. We do this by each week interviewing an animal industry professional and I ask them what are the skills and personal qualities needed to do what they do. But now I'm joined by Jemima Paddy Jones. Jemima Paddy Jones, MBE, welcome to the Practical Animal Channel again. Thank you and it's good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks again for your time, Jemima. So I was reading the newsletter of the International Centre for Birds of Prey uh, about public closure. And uh, I was intrigued. Um, I was wondering, could you tell us, Jemima, please, uh, what kind of impact has being a published author had on you going forward? I've always admired published authors, anybody who gets something published. Well, I don't know. I was very lucky when I when I wrote the books that I wrote, um, all bar one, which is actually not published. I've got it on Amazon Kindle, I think. Um, I was asked to write. So that makes life a lot easier if you're invited to write a book rather than um, rather than actually write one and then hope to flog the damn thing. So from that point of view, it was it was very easy. Um, and what I always wanted to do, and of course failed dismally to do, is when you're asked to write something, write it well before the deadline and then leave it so you can then come back to it and go, holy Moses, I should not have written that. Well, needless to say that that's not what happened. So I wrote it so that it was just about done by the deadline. <clears throat> and occasionally I look at it now and most of the time I go, well, actually, that's not bad. That's quite good. And then sometimes I look at it and go, whoops, probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> 
what impact has receiving the MBE had on you going forward? Well, I would have said not a lot. Um, I always really wanted to get a, an honorary doctorate. It was a huge honor to get it from the Queen. It was a huge honor to get it for um, the work that we do, that I've been doing in conservation. <clears throat> Where it's impacted on my life, I'm not sure, although oddly, today it sort of did because I'm now trying to find a new property um, to move to, which I guess we'll come on to in a minute. And one of the estate agents that I spoke to um, wanted to know about me. I said, look, all you have to do is Google my name and there'll be about a million things come up about me. And I, he then phoned me later to say I could go and look at a property. And he said, oh, I Googled you and you've got an MBE and blah, blah, blah. But actually, my sister has an OBE and my brother-in-law, who sadly died recently, had a CBE. So they're way ahead of me, both of them. We're a very BE'd family. And what about being the CEO of the International Centre for Birds of Prey? What effect is oh, that? Wow. Another acronym. Um, it's, what you have to understand about me is I, I'm sort of fairly bossy uh, because having spent my whole life writing books and trying to teach people how to do stuff and having staff and what have you, <clears throat> um, if you don't, if you're not bossy, then you can't get people doing things. Because I'm one of the people who say, oh, for Christ's sake, you know, you've only got one life, get on with it. And, and if you're working, I, I've always worked very hard. Um, and whenever I have finished working in anywhere, I've always made sure that everything I have done is left clean and tidy and the whole place looks wonderful. And I've probably worked for 10 times harder than I would have done normally. And I don't see that these days. So being a CEO now is not as much fun as it used to be. Also, um, <clears throat> we're now a charity. So uh, I'm not really the boss. I'm employed by the charity, um, which is OK. But actually, I really quite like being the boss without the charity, um, which I'm sure some people understand. And as soon as you... The reason I turned it charitable was trying to make sure that it has a long term future uh, <clears throat> and it, that has done that. But I really quite like being in complete control. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> and if people don't like it, quite frankly, I don't give a damn. <laughs> so do you have many trustees to answer to then? They're very good. We've got um, six trustees at the moment and they are very understanding. They uh, cope with everything that we have been having to do, which has been a huge um, upheaval, as you know, in the last four or five months. Um, and they, they see the vision for the future, which is the important thing. I read in the newsletter <clears throat> that ICBP is going to close well yes icbp is not only going to close but it already has we it's been a difficult decision we looked at where we are now both physically uh the infrastructure um all the things that we do and then put on top of that the impact of covid and the impact of the new zoo licensing legislation and to make the to look at this place now, it's slowly going downhill. I was very interested. I went to another zoo the other day, a huge place that should have absolutely bucketfuls of money. And I was sort of disappointed at how fractionally tatty everything looked. And I thought, I really want to make sure that we're not slipping down a slope of, which you see with a lot of places, you know, you build an aviary, it looks great for the first three years and then it starts to look slightly old and then things change and you need to do different things. And so we looked at what we needed to do to make this place keep the reputation that it has. And it has a phenomenal reputation and well-deserved as well. Well-deserved by the place, by the staff, by the volunteers, by all the people that work here. And I hope to a certain extent by me as well. And 
I just didn't want to lose that reputation. And if we'd gone on without putting in a considerable, and I mean a considerable amount of money, probably over three and a half million into the place, we were going to slip down the slippery slope. And I was just not interested in doing that. And neither were the trustees or any of the staff. So it was, it was a rounded decision by everybody. And we looked at, I mean, I actually said, if I won the lottery tomorrow, which would be jolly nice if I did, um, I wouldn't spend three and a half million here because we are totally in the wrong place. When we first came here, which was 55 years ago, 56 actually, this was going to be our 55th anniversary in May this year. The cars were Morris Minor Thousands, the tractors were Massey Ferguson's 135s. These days, everybody's got a rental car. They know that if they scratch the damn car there, when they turn it in for the next new one, they're not going to get the same amount of money. So they won't get over into the hedge. So they get, I swear most people don't know how wide their bloody car is anyway. Um, and the tractors are so damn big, they don't even have their tires on the road anymore. They're on the hedge. And that makes it very difficult to get to a place like this, which is up a relatively narrow road. And when they say location, 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 I used to fight against that and say, no, 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 no. People go miles in huge buses to go to really beautiful gardens. But actually, it is true. Location is crucial. So we thought, OK, well, <clears throat> we don't want to lose all the work that we've done. And the, the real good work that we do, apart from teaching people to really value birds of prey, which they do when they visit, is some of the stuff that people don't see, the stuff behind the scenes, the, the less um, publicized parts of the work that we do. So that's the conservation breeding, <clears throat> the research, the, um, all the advice we give, uh, the work that I do in India, the work that I do in Nepal, uh, the work that I do with things like hen harriers in this country, all of that is very special. Um, and so we decided to forget about the public side and, <clears throat> and close to the public, which was hard to do. Although there were bits where there was like quite good, so I don't have to be rude. I don't have to be polite to everybody who's got really badly behaved children now is a huge bonus well, we won't go into that um but but a lot of the visitors most of the visitors in fact i think i would say in comparison to some of the zoos that i know we have been incredibly lucky with our visitors they behave they generally don't climb fences they don't normally throw things at the birds we have been absolutely lucky and i don't know whether it's because we're out in the sticks or because people are terrified of me or what it is. But anyway, we have been incredibly lucky and we have a fantastic bunch of volunteers and a fantastic bunch of visitors. And you'll always get people who are a pain in the rear end. Um, and they're always the ones I upset and then they put rude comments on TripAdvisor. But now we're closed. I don't care. Yippee. <laughs> but it's been really tough. And the other thing we've had to do, which for, for Holly, who is my curator and myself, um, has been really tough, particularly this week, is letting the birds go, let them go into new, hum new homes. Uh, we've been incredibly picky. We have, Holly's done a phenomenal amount of work um, getting hold of people. I've done some of it, um, seeing who would like our birds. And we only have, I think, three that we haven't yet found homes for. And by the end of this month, the bulk of them will have gone to homes that are either as good or have better housing than we do. And that for us was really important. But I have to say, it's really tough to see them go. Um, and, you know, we catch them up and we put them in the boxes and most people bring good boxes. Some of them bring absolutely crap boxes and they are immediately told that their boxes are crap and we're not going to put our birds into them. And so we put them in better birds, or better boxes. Um, I guess that for me, because I, I, most people are dealing with Holly rather than directly with me, I don't think most of them know that actually the birds don't belong to the charity. The bulk of them belong to me. 
So I am giving away, and we're not selling them, we are giving them, we are gifting them um, to all these people. And a few have been great. A few have been really grateful, really thankful, have made both Holly and I feel like they're pleased to be given these birds. And some of them, which I am fractionally pissed off about, seem to think they're doing us a big favor. When they are getting absolutely stunning birds, mostly in 100% feather condition, that are excellent flying birds if they're flying demonstration birds. And I just somehow feel, if somebody offered me that, put it this way, if somebody offered me that, I'd be a bloody sight more grateful than some of them are. But apart from that, it's hard to see them go. It's, it's I'd, I have to say, I'd quite like to see them all go fairly quickly because the more drawn out it is, the harder it is. You know, two go here, five go here, three go there, seven go over there, and they're all different days. <clears throat> and it, it's, and Holly's gets all paperwork done. So they have paperwork as to what the bird is. And then we talk to them about how they fly and what their idiosyncrasies are. And so it has been hard, but we're nearly there. Um, all the vultures are going with Holly and Adam, all bar, I think, for the New World vultures. All the rest are going with Holly and Adam. Um, and I am taking, well, I thought it was eight birds, but I could only count six at the moment. But I think I'm taking eight. Oh, I remember one of them's a vulture. Uh, I'm taking eight birds uh, who are either so old nobody would want them or too cantankerous. And so they wouldn't really be very good for anybody or just birds I can't bear to get rid of, um, like hemp, my Eurasian eagle owl, who knows the sound of my wellies as I walk down the path. <laughs> Jemima, you're at the top of your game in your field. What sort of criteria did you apply to rehoming the birds? Oh, well, first thing we did was we needed to know the people. We looked at their aviaries, we asked them for photographs of their housing, um, we wanted to know what their experience was, and there were a couple of people we turned down, um, but generally speaking, we were very pleased with uh, where the birds are going and how they're going to be flown and looked after, otherwise we wouldn't have let them have them, simple as that. I came and visited several years ago, um, you signed my books, which I've never forgotten. Um, after that, I was a, a keen fan following the work that you do. Um, I didn't send you this question, so I hope you don't mind me asking. No, I don't mind. What happened with America? Oh, that was a bloody disaster. <clears throat> um, I had been, I mean, it was a, it was a, a gamble that I took. Apparently my whole life is a gamble. Um, I had been running the place here on my own since my ex-husband disappeared, which reminds me, if he doesn't come and collect his bloody guitars before I go, I'm going to vlog them. <laughs> and some of them are quite valuable. That'd be quite good. Um, and when you do things on your own, sometimes it's nice to have someone to share the decisions and the ideas and what have you. And I met this group and I went over and helped them with rehabilitation. And I thought the volunteers were great and I liked the chap who was running it. And he suggested that it might be an idea that we um, joined forces. And for some reason, best known to myself, I thought it was a great idea. And I'd been going out for probably two months a year for since for four, year, four or five years before I actually moved out there. And we were given a huge chunk of land, 100 acres, which, which would have been lovely. Um, actually, South Carolina is a bit of an armpit. And the mosquitoes are about the same size as a bald eagle and bite. Um, and so eventually, I went out there. And it was quite extraordinary. It was as if the, the uh, executive director over there went through a personality change the day I arrived. Uh, and it was really extraordinary when I was out there before, when we went to board meetings, because it was a trustee, it was a charity. I would go in his car, we'd go out to a really nice sushi restaurant afterwards, and we'd discuss what was going on. From the day I arrived, 
I was on my own. I had to get there by myself in my own car. Um, and then I drove back on my own as well. I thought, hang on a minute, this isn't what we what I bought into. And it slowly got worse and worse and worse until eventually I was supposed to go to a meeting to tell the board why I should run the public side and the other chap should run the rehabilita rehabilitation side because that was both of ours talents, as it were. Um, and I'd had to have, I was supposed to have a meeting with him probably about four days before, which actually was on my birthday. And he, he phoned me up and said, we can't possibly have a meeting, have a meeting. We haven't got an agenda. We're two of us for crying out loud. So he refused to have a meeting. So that night, the night before the meeting, one of my Labradors, Arabis, decided to have puppies. Only they were obviously, we weren't expecting them. And I don't know what the father was, but she had bits of puppies. She'd obviously started to absorb them. So I had to rush her to the vet. I was up with her all night and then I had a meeting the next morning. And in the end, I thought, this is crazy. This is not going to work. So I went to see the really nice lawyer who was helping me pro bono. There's a wonderful chap called Marshall Allen. And I said to him, Marshall, I'm going to offer them my, my resignation. And he said, there is no way they'll accept it. They will not accept it. They must understand how important you are to this venture. And I said, watch this space. They will bite my hand off. And that's exactly what they did. And then I sat there after they had bitten my hand off and said, yes, we'll accept your resignation. I thought, okay, I have 169 birds of prey. I have six dogs. I have nowhere to live. I have no idea where I'm going. What the bloody hell am I going to do now? But we got there in the end. Because you Quite sold. a story, eh? Yeah. <clears throat> You'd sold the property at Newins, hadn't you? And you bought it back. Yep. yep, sold this. I had nowhere to go. By the time I got back and had got back here, I had lost probably three quarters of a million pounds. Um, and I only got back here because an amazing chap lent me three quarters of a million pounds just before I was about to be sued. Um, and in fact, now we have closed and I have hopefully sold this property. I'm finally going to pay him back, which will make me feel very good because he's been amazing. Well, wow. when is the autobiography coming out? Sorry? When is the autobiography coming out? Mm. Well, first of all, Holly and Adam are taking all the birds to a specialist vulture place in West Wales, which will not be open to the public, but will do a huge amount of good in vulture conservation. And I hope I will be slightly involved in that. Um, and I have to move and I have to find somewhere to live. So I'm actually going down on Monday to have a look at a property in Devon. And but I'm looking Devon. Uh, Dorset, Somerset, uh, Norfolk, Derbyshire. I'm sort of trying to have a wide view because what I'm going to do is the charity is going to move with me and I'm going to continue with the Hen Harrier Conservation Breeding Program, which really interests me. Hen Harriers are amazing birds. I've done all the stuff on the brood management. Nobody, as far as I know, has ever bred hen harriers seriously in captivity. And I think there's one breeding in Spain, but otherwise people haven't. And I think we can. And the brood management has been very successful. So it would be nice to be involved in a release program of birds that we have bred on a conservation breeding program in this country. Uh, brood management is... Um, in Northern England, a lot of the hen harriers, well, most of the hen harriers were not able to breed because there was huge amounts of persecution. And in fact, either in 90, in 2015 or 16, I can never remember which, uh, there were no hen harriers bred in Northern England. Uh, and so there'd been a, a 10 year load of meetings to try and work out a plan to conserve hen harriers. And one of those aspects on that plan was brood management. Now the problem with hen harriers is when they have babies, they're very good at eating all the, all the grouse chicks they can find. If they don't have babies, they don't eat anywhere near as many grouse chicks. So 
what I do under license is I go up to Northern England where there is a hen harrier nesting within 10 kilometers of another hen harrier and where we have permission. And I go and take, uh, originally it was, I was going to take eggs, but actually by the time the license comes through, I take newly hatched young, bring them down here to Gloucestershire, rear them for three weeks until they can pull mice for themselves. Then I go back up to Yorkshire and we have a very nice release uh, aviary, which I designed, which uh, we pop them in. And about another three weeks after that, when they can fly well in the aviary and after they have been satellite tagged, we release them. And I mean, this will be the fourth year that I have done it and it works incredibly well. I have seen, I didn't think it was going to work. Now, I will be absolutely honest. I went ahead doing this saying, I'm going to do this because I think I'm actually the right person to do it, but I don't think it'll work. I think that's rubbish. But actually, I've changed my mind. Um, I have seen a noticeable change in the attitude of the landowners and the keepers who are involved in brood management. They're doing what's called diversionary feeding, where you put food out for the hen harriers so they eat whatever you put out there rather than nobbling the grass. That's working well to the point where when the keepers put the food out, the hen harriers are coming in and taking it before they've gone so they know their birds. And some of them actually get to, to have some sort of relationship with them, which is what you want with stakeholders. Um, they have, the first year I went up there, I don't think they were too pleased to see me, but they've been really helpful. And when you think that no hen harriers were bred uh, either in 2015 or 16, last year we had 84 babies. You know, you can't argue with that. And not only that, but uh, four of the hen harriers that we released in 2020 bred in the wild in 2021 which I think is flipping amazing. And I'm very proud of it. It sounds fascinating. Anybody who wants to get up to speed with this, um, is there a, a report anywhere or literature? Uh, there'll be reports on Natural England, uh, on the Natural England website. Uh, we, I think there's a Natural England blob, blob, blog that talks about it. Um, there are some aspects obviously that we can't talk about yet. Uh, but once the trial is over, and this is the last year of the trial, uh, then there will, I'm sure, be some sort of information out there. So we put the information on how, on how the hen harriers are doing, how they're surviving, how many have bred. It's all out there if you, if you have a look on the Natural England website. What's next in your career, Jemima? Finding a new home. <laughs> Finding a new home. Building eight aviaries for the birds I'm taking with me. Uh, moving all my furniture, which I hope to gobble going. Well, no, I won't be moving all my furniture because I'm in an eight bedroom Victorian house at the moment. And there is no way all my furniture will go in a smaller house. I'm downsizing, which I swore I would never do. I always said I'd rather upsize. But I'm downsizing, sort of. And so long as I can take my piano and various other things that I like, that'll be okay. And my plan is I've got to get everything settled and comfortable and right before I move the dogs, because I don't want them to be stressed. And then the dogs and I will move to wherever we're going. And I will continue with the Hen Harrier program. I will continue with the vulture work that I do with the RSPB in India and Nepal. And um, if anybody would like to pay me as a consultant, I will be available. Can you outline what happens in India and Nepal, those projects? What's happening in India and Nepal? Well, how far back do you want me to go? Mm. Um, in <clears throat> the work I do in India and Nepal is to do with critically endangered vultures, which is actually very interesting because one of the things that seriously annoys me <clears throat> from the people who've done the new zoo standards is that they're saying <clears throat> you shouldn't waste time breeding common species. Now, number one, 
how do they know what is going to be common two decades from now? And number two, that'll be number two, uh, what you can learn from a common species can then be put on to a critically endangered species that is closely related. So by saying, oh, no, 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 no more zoos, zoos mustn't be spending time wasting it, breeding common species, just goes to show that both Thefra and the zoos, not very expert group, actually don't know what they're talking about because conservation is not a fixed thing. In, in when I went over to India the first time, <clears throat> which was 1999, nobody had even noticed that the birds had had a huge, and I mean huge, population crash. It was finally noticed by a very good chap called Dr. Vibhu Prakash, who shouted and waved flags and said, oi, something's going on. Um, and then we realized that what, what was, Zoo's expert group, please note, the most common large bird of prey in the world in terms of numbers is now critically endangered in two decades. So don't come out with this rubbish in the new zoo licensing act without knowing what you're talking about. And I do know what I'm talking about. So because of my experience with breeding a common species like Eurasian griffin vultures, um, I was asked to help with the vulture conservation breeding program. Now, the one, the one thing I would say here is that a conservation breeding program it's usually one of your last resorts. So you, you only really do a conservation breeding program if the numbers of birds have got down to a level where it's seriously concerning, or like the hen harrier where they've been made extinct in Southern England. Those two reasons are good enough to start a conservation breeding program. Otherwise, it's actually better to get the habitat right. But with the vultures in India, we needed to move fast before we lost everyone. So I designed um, the breeding project, uh, the breeding aviaries, trained the staff, go over regularly to talk to them, uh, well, before COVID, go out regularly to talk to them about the project, assist with things like um, advocacy, um, staffing, and all the rest of it. And we, it's been incredibly success, successful. We have bred all the species of endangered vultures in India. They know what they're doing. Um, and all we need to do now is be able to release them, which in India we can't do yet because the environment is not right for them. But in Nepal, bearing in mind, Nepal is a tiny country in comparison to India. Nepal has been amazing in not so good on the breeding. The breeding they have done some, but they haven't been that successful at it. But boy, oh boy, have they been good on getting the vulture safe zones done and because they've got the environment right for the vultures and the cause i.e the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory diclofenac non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug diclofenac has been banned and they go into the pharmacies and make sure it's not there their vultures are now not only stable but they're increasing and i am extremely proud to be able to tell you that one of the vultures we did breed in Nepal has now bred in the wild with a wild vulture and has a very healthy, happy chick. So there you go, it does work. Fantastic. But the politics of conservation is always interesting. Yeah, any comments about the, the politics of conservation? <laughs> yeah, don't touch it with a barge pole. <laughs> <laughs> what I usually say, I have a lot of people ask me how they can get into working with birds of prey, how they can get into conservation and it's not easy to tell anybody how, you know, I have no idea how I got into it. I fell into it, I guess, um, by going to conferences, by seeing that things were needed, by realizing that scientists don't know it all, but by being prepared not to sound too big headed about the fact that they don't know it all, um, by volunteering, by helping, um, by reading a lot, by understanding what the problems are and by being, I'm afraid to say, in the right place at the right time. Um, and it's not something which happens easily. And one of the things I always say, what I'm going to do when I, I'm going to be inclined one person to help me with the, uh, with the Hen Harrier project, I need uh, an aviculturalist. 
And I told my staff here, one of the things I was going to do was ask all the people who come on a, on a, an interview to go into a shed and get me a spade and see if they could tell the difference between a spade and a shovel. <laughs> <laughs> Well, somebody then said, well, what if there are no spades in there? And I said, well, uh, we'll see. They'll either come back and say there aren't any spades in there, or if they're really good, they'll come back and say, I could, there's no spades in there, but I brought you a shovel just in case. <laughs> <laughs> and also so that, that shows forward thinking. Mm, mm. Um, I've got dozens of things I'd like to ask, but I fear time is against me. Penultimate question then. Uh, was there something in the new Zoo Licensing Act about stipulating how smaller collections must be somehow involved with an overseas conservation project? Yeah, it was absolute rubbish. They said that well, all the collections, but, but it started small, medium and large, that just collecting funds for a conservation project does not count as conservation. Well, I have to tell you this, as far as I, I'll lay you money, most of the people, with the exception of one that I know, who um, are on the zoo's expert group, do not understand how difficult it is for people in a foreign country to have to deal with a volunteer that they send out so it looks like they've got staff going out to help. Most of them would much rather have a chunk of money, which then they can put into their conservation pro program and get it to work, then one of the zoo staff coming out for two weeks where they've got to look after them, they've got to house them, they've got to make sure they're okay, they've got to make sure that there's no danger for them, all of which is a draw on the conservation program. So by saying just, just having fundraising is not good enough, I'm sorry, but that shows the total ignorance of both DEFRA and the zoo's expert group. Do you want to ask me about tethering while you're at it? Yes. What do you think about? <laughs> yeah, that's another one. You know, in all seriousness, um, we decided to close because we need to put too much into the place, because we didn't want it to slip back. We're in the wrong location, blah, blah, blah. But actually, one of the reasons was for me that I would not have complied with the new proposed standards because as far as I am concerned, saying that you cannot tether a parent reared bird for a short period to train it is absolutely wrong. And I don't care what anybody says, I have trained enough completely wild birds and parent reared birds. I'm just training one now that we bred two years ago, uh, has not been touched, literally has not been touched. So it's wild as stink. If I hadn't been able to tether it, the chances of it injuring itself in an aviary when I go in to ask if it would like to do something um, or taking 10 times longer, 20 times longer to train than if I tethered it for a short period shows the complete lack of understanding from the zoos expert group and from DEFRA none of which who have trained birds to the extent that those people who are experts, including three vets that I can tell you of, three avian expert vets who are also falconers, who are also saying this is wrong, this is against the welfare of birds of prey. And it absolutely is. So in the end, if I'd refused to do it, they probably would have closed me, but I would have been standing up for what I believe is right with a phenomenal amount of expertise behind me. Is it true that you're going to be presenting the Golden Globes in Hollywood next year? <laughs> no. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> is there anything I don't think I'm really about to add? To Sorry? Is there anything you'd like to add? I uh, know, I'm sure I've upset lots of people out there, but you know, who cares? I'm 73 now. If I can't say what I think, and use my experience, it's a very poor show. And, you know, I am absolutely deadly serious about what I say. Um, I do believe that some of the things that the new zoo standards are putting forward are wrong. And I think they've been badly written, badly thought out and been done by people who, in my opinion, are not experts. So there we are. So wish me luck. I've got to find a wonderful home and take my piano and my Labradors and my 
eight birds of prey and heaven knows what else and make a new life. You happy to come back on the show in a year and talk about hen harriers? What? Well, yeah, come back. Uh, give me a year and a half. I will do. I can't wait. Jemima right. Penny Jones, CEO of the ICBP. Thank you very much for being on the Practical Animal Channel. Okay, take care. That was Jemima Perry Jones, MBE, CEO of the International Centre for Birds of Prey, talking about closure of her zoo to the public. She talked about brood management of hen harriers in the north of England, diversionary feeding of chicks, and her work on vultures of the genus Gips in India and Nepal. Gips vultures have suffered catastrophic population crashes in recent years due to poisoning with the chemical diclofenac. Jemima is working to address the collapse. She is also available as a bird of prey consultant. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful in terms of being informative about the conservation management of birds of prey, in particular British hen harriers and gips vultures in India Nepal, please consider not only clicking like but also sharing it with your friends and followers. For more exclusive content on wildlife conservation, the countryside and the animal industry from experts directly involved professionally, please consider subscribing to the channel. Next week, my guest is Rick Simpson. Rick, together with his wife Elise, is co-founder of the specialist bird conservation charity WaderQuest. He joins me next week.